right? Oh, you're perfect. Right. Okay, we're live now. All right. So, well, welcome, Emily. Um, this is our guest today, Emily uh, Baltz, and um, she is, um, well, um, our guest for the 37th Food Talk. We're reaching number 40. We're very eager to get to that. It's kind of our goal uh, this school year, let's say, and I'm going to introduce um, our guest today, and then Please, Emily, you, you take the floor. But um, well, her topic, as you might have noticed, is um, entitled Embodied Eating. And um, Emily is best known for her delightful innovation work in food and technology, where she uses food as a medium and metaphor for designing uh, experiences. And she has been working for 20 years in design, hospitality, performance, technology, and new media. We're all jealous, actually. Um, but our fluency across diverse creative industries have, um, has successfully embraced, um, made her embrace other um, experiences, both analog and digital. Um, her expertise lies in using the five senses, senses to tell stories that deepen engagement through uh, embodiment. And she is a founding member of the New York, um, sorry, New Inc., uh, the first museum led um, incubator hosted by the New Museum. And is also part of the founding faculty of the School of Visual Arts, Products of Design, um, MFA program, as well as the father of the first food design studio at Pratt um, Institute. So um, um, she's also the author of the award-winning LOVE food book. Uh, I hope you tell us about that as well, because we're fans, and recipient of best first uh, cookbook in the world at the Prix Gourmet held annually in the Louvre, Paris, as well as the nationally featured cookbook, Junk Foodie, uh, 51 delicious recipes for the Aubrain Gourmet, and um, Emily also bachelor's degree in film studies, which is very interesting because we keep talking about different areas coming together. So this is really interesting from Vassar College and a master's degree in industrial design from Pratt Institute. So from 1994 to 2000, she trained intensively in contemporary dance, which is something very performative as well, right? And um, classical voice learning, what it means to connect, listen and harmonize with others. So thank you so much once again for being here, um, being our uh, guest. We're very, very happy to have you with us. And please, the floor is yours. You can share with sound. We're very eager to listen to you. Great, thank you so much for having me. I am going to share this quickly. And let me know if you can't, if anything goes awry. Okay. I also seem to have taken on the persona of a gamer with my new <laughs> microphone headset. So <laughs> bear yeah, with me. As I, professional. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the pandemic really has made us all go to <laughs> interesting new ways. But uh, thank you so much. And what a treat to present at this. I think when I was starting my career, this program would have been a dream. So. <laughs> I really congratulate all of you for putting this together and every everyone who is participating too. Today, as said, I want to talk to you about my own practice a bit through this lens, which I call embodied eating. Embodied eating meaning eating that is of the body and deconstruct a little bit more about what that means. Uh, because obviously when we feed ourselves, we feed our bodies, but we also do so much more. And that's been at the heart of my own practice and investigation throughout the last uh, 15 to 20 years. I have been working most recently, uh, this is I think the work that I've become more known for, is the intersection of food and technology. So using new media and new technologies as an ingredient for changing, enhancing, disrupting, provoking our food experience. So I create things like immersive dinners, speculative objects, um, immersive performances. I work a lot in music festivals with brands and marketing, also with cultural institutions, um, as well as uh, have published a few different books. There you see in the middle, the Love Food book, which was mentioned up front. So I've always been really interested in how I could try to integrate all of my identities into one thing. Uh, 
And when we talk about transmedia or transversal design, I think food is such a great container for exploring all of those. Personally, I work as an artist designer. I've worked as a screenwriter, a performer, a photographer, an educator, a friend, a wife, a mother, a director, just to name a few. But right now, I want to tell you I'm 42 years and six months old. So this is me today. <laughs> and I'm also a human. So those might be the two simplest, most basic buckets that I can present myself in. And those are two things that I think will you also see become a red thread throughout this presentation. Uh, I want to start my storytelling, let's say right here. So I have a son who's three years old. You see his little hands pictured here on the left. And we've been reading this book about planet Earth recently. And these two pages specifically, they really strike me. Um, they kind of divide, it's about what is our planet? What is earth made of? And um, it says, you know, we are made of people and people act in this way. And to be a person, um, you have a body. And here are all the different parts of the body, the head, the brain, the arms, the belly, the heart, the lungs, the legs, the bones. And the sweet little thing he's covering up that take care of it because most of the bits don't grow back except for your nails and your hair. <laughs> <laughs> which I find to be a sweet anecdote for any three-year-old to grow up with. And then on the facing page, to zoom into that one, it says the most important things for people to remember are to eat, drink, and stay warm. And I find that this is a really powerful statement, specifically in context of the work that we do, that two out of the three most important things for people to do involve eating and drinking. And you know, obviously this ties directly to the now famous, almost cliched Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that as people, we need a certain strata uh, to exist, specifically our physiological needs, which are food and shelter. And then we go up through feeling safe, creating love and belonging, having self-esteem and self-actualizing, which is where we might say creativity lands. Um, and in doing so, I think when I think about the role of food, we obviously see it illustrated, you know, here's this little cave person with like a, a leg of ham or something in their arms at the very bottom. And I think throughout time and maybe still to this day, we think about food as a sort of basic primordial need. Um, but it actually is obviously part of our entire lives. So not only does it nourish us, give us calories to get up and go in the morning, but it also fulfills so many different roles in our life allows us to bond with each other, make meaning with each other, invent, be creative. And that spectrum is something that I was really interested in my own practice as a young designer to start exploring and to create more vocabulary around, um, to really start to unearth how, why, and what if food could be part of our entire lives, looking at it instead of just as an ingredient, but as a medium, a medium for all sorts of different stories in the world. And so today I'll take you through a couple of the ways that I've used food as medium to explore different parts of my own identity, um, as well as the experience of living here on planet Earth. Now, this all started in 2005. So I'm half French and half American. My mother is French, my father was American, and I grew up outside of Chicago. And food played a big role in our lives because my mother continued her French culinary traditions in our home which meant that we ate differently at different times um, and continued kind of gastronomic traditions in the middle of mostly American fast food culture. So when I was a young designer, um, I started, I did my master's degree at Pratt Institute in 2005 off the heels of uh, studying film studies and contemporary dance, as you heard. And while I was doing my thesis, maybe similar to what what you are all um, exploring right now is a topic of personal interest. So we could spend about a year researching one topic that was either interesting to us, interesting to the world, hopefully a combination of the both. And I thought how interesting at the time in 2005, food was not really defined as a material of design yet. It still landed mostly in the categories of hospitality, restaurateurs, chefs, the culinary arts. And so I wanted to explore how it might be used as a material for design, specifically on how um, it could be used or explored as a material for mythology within American culture. Simply put, why do Americans eat the way that they do? Um, and how, how might the, the mythology in America affect 
consumption behaviors. And so this thesis is published somewhere in the dark, dark stacks of Pratt Institute Library, open wide the effect of cultural mythology on the American appetite. Every year I tell myself I'm going to revisit this and actually do the research I now would want to do on it. But it really laid a foundation for my entire practice um, and specifically revealed my interest in human behavior um, and in how context, environment, and culture affects how we consume, believing that food was our most fundamental form of consumption. And if perhaps we could affect how people eat, we might also affect how they behave. And so with that, I did um, also some embodied research myself. I worked in fine dining during that time, made a lot of connections with different chefs and restaurateurs. This pictured here is Suba Restaurant in 2004, 2005 um, on the Lower East Side, which was kind of the dawn of molecular um, cuisine in America. Uh, El Bulli had just started, chefs were going there to get trained and they were coming back to the States, specifically in New York and using it um, in new and novel ways. So this was really exciting to me. It was wonderful. It informed a lot of my thesis work, exploring how food could be used as a material for storytelling, which I think molecular gastronomy does so well. After that, I graduated from Pratt and I had a strange job opportunity pop, pop up, which is kind of the way that my life goes. I was offered a job in Paris with Arik Levy, um, an Israeli designer who has been working in Paris for the last 40 years, designing like furniture, electronics, tabletop, lighting. Uh, I said yes. I kind of dropped my food thesis and I ran to Paris and learned everything I could possibly learn about making things, the business of product design, which I had also obviously uh, been training in. And this was a wonderful and transformative year and I really learned a ton. Um, and then ended up coming back to the US for a variety of reasons and working. And what is not pictured here, but I want to share this with you because I think it's important as a student when you look at other professionals to know the story behind them. I came back and I didn't I didn't work right away in food again. I worked as a tabletop designer. I worked as a brand strategist after this. Um, and along that, between about 2006 to 2009, I kept my own personal interests alive as one might call it a side hustle. Um, doing gallery shows, doing dinners and experiences in my own home, trying to do as much as I could to understand how I wanted to use this personal interest of food in my professional life. Because I think when you combine those two things, it's very fulfilling, but it's also high risk because it is also usually emotional. So the first thing that I did um, that I think had any real merit was about 2008, I was interested in looking a little bit back. This idea of food as culture, which I had studied in my thesis, I wanted to give a little bit clearer voice to. Um, you know, how could food have a voice? What are the stories that are embedded within it? Quite literally, you know, the stuff of our everyday, like homemade chocolate chip cookies. So I installed this very, very DIY uh, food bank, which I called it, which was an armoire I found on like Craigslist, you know, a, sort of a, a sharing website. <laughs> Got borrowed a friend's car, brought it into my house. As you can see here, the front has been scraped. This weird purple paint was scraped off of it. The back, I didn't quite have the gusto to get to it because it turned into be a bigger project than I thought. Um, but I ins what I what I did install here was a recording booth, which you can see there's a microphone hanging from above and a little button that allows you to turn it on to record. And I asked everyone to record their favorite food memories. This was part of a food themed uh, gallery show in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And the result was hundreds of people came into this booth and shared their favorite food memories. And New York being the diverse place that it is, is that we got American perspectives. We also got Colombian perspectives, Spanish perspectives, Italian, it, you know, the diversity was really wonderful and abundant. And so this went into an archive and started to become sorted as a new lexicon, right? To create an archive of food memories that could be sorted through provenance, ingredient, and also event. So we could see how food can be attached to all these different experiences in our lives. You know, also I will say, call out, this is very kind of classically sort of a, a, a different way to do design research. Um, from that, I kept working. And as I said, I was working in different design studios and I was in an agency at the time and I was uh, a little bored. <laughs> <laughs> and I was using the free office snacks to distract myself at lunchtime to make 
you know, kind of fanciful things. And uh, my thesis advisor when I was at Pratt was a man named Alan Chachanoff, who at the time ran course77.com, a big industrial design website. And he asked me if I would make something, he knew my work in food because he was my thesis advisor, if I would make something food-based for this new issue called Hack to Work, Essential Tips for the Design Professional. So things that you could do to improve your creativity in the office. And so I said, oh, I'm doing just that. I'll make this series of recipes that's about using our office snacks uh, to become something more. So this emerged, which was office snack gourmet, how to turn junk food into something more. And I made five different recipes that were based on the office pantry snacks, um, as well as the gas, the kind of classic gastronomic French recipes I had grown up with in my, in my youth. This went on the internet and lo and behold, uh, several weeks later, I got a call from a, um, a book publisher who said, hey, we saw all of these wild uh, junk food recipes that you make, and we're wondering if you would want to make a book out of it, specifically uh, a book that is about junk foodiness. How can you turn um, kind of lowbrow foods into highbrow recipes? And so uh, I got a book deal. Um, and I first they asked me if I would do 101 recipes and I negotiated it down to 51. <laughs> and uh, I quit my job with this advance and off I went and I got a studio and started, started what I would say more formally is my food design career. And this book uh, was divided into several different categories from breakfast to lunch, dinners, amuse-bouche, desserts, cocktails. I developed kind of techniques, I would call them, things that you see here pictured on the upper right hand of the screen called the smash, where you take a bag of potato chips, you open a little top part of it, and then you smash it very violently to create like a fine powder of potato chip crispy. I also discovered that the Jelly Belly, which is like a exotically flavored jelly bean collection, was kind of the bouillon cube of junk food. It allowed you to have all of these different tropical flavors that you couldn't otherwise get. I also discovered that the palette of junk food is mainly orange and brown. Um, but all that said, I use this really both as a material study and also as recipe development. And I gave myself the challenge to deconstruct all of the junk food materials that I could find and see how I might remake some of these classic um, these kind of classic gastronomic recipes. So one of my favorites is pictured here, the Twinkie Napoleon. The Twinkie, if you don't know what it is, it's this like puff, kind of puff pastry extruded cake with uh, cream, pastry cream uh, shot into it. So very much like one of the classic American industrial uh, treats out there. Supposedly it can last for 250 years also. <laughs> So it has a lot of emulsifiers in it. You can cut it apart. You take out the cream from inside, reserve it, and then you can reconstitute the dough by just squishing it back. Um, and so the cake becomes, sorry, the cake becomes dough and you roll it out very thinly, add the reserved cream, a little bit of smashed potato chips, you know, repeat, 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 top with a potato chip. And the wild thing is that the experience of this in terms of sensory experience is almost nearly the same as biting into a Napoleon. It's crunchy, it's crispy, it's sweet, it's salty, it's ooey, it's gooey. And you put it inside of your mouth and something that I think in American culture we think of as so base, so crass as a Twinkie becomes this elevated snack. And that for me was also personal reflection about my own cultural experience, um, as well as using my design skills to really do a material study and um, kind of enter into, I guess, my own version of food science. <laughs> so uh, this I went on, I made things like on the left here, a very, very jelly belly clafouti, which was like an industrial little mini pie that I took the filling out of put pudding, like vanilla pudding snacks and very, very jelly bellies in. On the right here is a circus peanut aron uh, on the macaron phase. Circus peanuts are like these also industrial marshmallow kind of bites cut them in half, filled them with the inside of a candy bar, uh, a coconut mounds bar, mix that with something called fun dip, which has a high amount of citric acid in it, and kind of ended up with this macaron feeling as well as well as flavor. So the fun went on. Um, I ended up making workshops, taking this to the public, asking them to reimagine kind of hack you know, industrial food culture. What else could you do with this? Which I think also had a little bit of an underlying um, let's say political commentary in it as well, that we are sold the foods 
that someone else thinks you know we want what happens when we are in power of remaking those so um junk foodie went a little bit around the world it got me on the stages of many conferences and talks i got on tv to do recipe demos <laughs> and as i said it really launched this this career that i now stand in that now pays for my life as well as my creative nourishment um, Along with all of this making, I'm going to jump around to, I'm going to present to you in a non-linear fashion. So these projects don't come one after another, but I think they relate to each other. Uh, within all of this, one of the, you know, the best things about this project was the act of making it. I loved studying de design because it was a physical embodied practice. We were making models and prototypes when I was studying. I loved using my body. Um, it really, I think, is a direct portal into creativity in the way that just using your mind can't bring. And food is such an amazing vehicle for that, because obviously when we make food, we are using our bodies at all times. And it plays this very important role of gesture. So making all these junk food recipes, I was mixing, I was chopping, I was smashing, I was using my body in the same way that I had as a dancer, you know, paying attention also to how I was using it. And I thought this was an insight that years later came back and Along my career, I'm often asked to do, you know, as I said, immersive dinners, and I think now we call them in the past, they might have been called creative dinners. <laughs> but in 2012, I was asked to make a dinner for the Armory Fair, um, which is a, a large art fair in New York City. And I thought about this as well as kind of the decorum of fine dining. Um, and how we could maybe break those codes. So to be disruptive, to provoke people into new ways, not only of engaging with their food, uh, feeling it, but also acting together in space. And so this dinner is called Traces. It is cutlery-less, cutlery plate-less. Um, there is a glass, which is not pictured. <laughs> but guests sit down to a large white canvas. And I ask everyone to sit with their palms up, as you see pictured here. So um, I do this because the food then gets dropped in between, two small bites is dropped in between their hands. And then the chef and I had choreographed this process throughout the dinner where we would engage with people's bodies. And the first gesture was quite literally drizzling sauce across their hands. And so here are all these people, you know, big fancy art donors uh, sitting here with food on their hands. <laughs> they were asked to wash their hands before. I should not forget to, to state that. And what is the first thing that you have to do when you're implicated now within this? Well, someone in the group is going to do what everyone thinks they should do but won't, is uh, lick their hand. And suddenly the rules are broken, right? We don't really lick our hands or play with our food in this way unless we are children. <clears throat> and so this was literally a gesture, yes. um, an invocation, yeah, of being able to break the codes of fine dining as well as kind of, I would say, the formality of the art world. And the dinner continued in this way. Food was designed to be served to engage different gestures, ripping apart, dipping, saucing, sharing. I look at this now through the lens of COVID and think, oh my God, how incredible we were able to do it. Um, and by the end, what happens is that based on the guests interaction with the food um, and the food also intentionally being highly colored and quite vibrant, so to be appealing to the eye, but also to create these abstract tableaus by the end that are evidence of the traces of our interaction with the food, but also with each other, given that every dish was designed to be shared in some way. So we're saucing together, we're ripping together, we're sharing together, we're leaning together. And uh, the result is, you know, in and of itself, I would say uh, a touch of a piece of art as we look at how the traces of our consumption can create the traces of the aesthetics in front of us. Now, as you probably hear me talk, you know that uh, dance plays a big role in my, in my practice. I think the act of dancing is a relationship to your body, to movement. And so choreography is also kind of a, a thread that I was interested in alongside this idea of food as gesture. And in 2013, I was asked to create um, a dinner for the premiere of a contemporary choreographer, Ralph Lemon, who practices, uh, who is American. And Ralph has this beautiful practice of exploring the boundaries of the theater. So where does dance begin and end? And so this uh, was specifically a premiere that was happening at MPAC, the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center in Troy, New York, a couple hours north of New York City. And here Ralph was exploring uh, where the walls of the theater existed. Like, 
where did the performance begin? Where did it end? The audience was within the space. Um, a provocative way of exploring choreography and its relationship to audience. And so in response, I quite literally <laughs> wanted to respond in a similar fashion to create deeper meaning for this premiere. And so what you see here is a table made of spandex. Um, it seats 40 uh, preeminent performing arts and performance art curators from around the United States that were invited. And if you can see here in some of the details of this, the chairs are stretched in spandex, the table is stretched in spandex, and the physical experience of it is that you sit down and instead of having this kind of you know linear flat, if I was presenting to you in person, I'd be acting all this out. So I'll do my best through a screen. But what happens is you sit down and your body sort of sinks into the table, which is a relationship, a physical relationship, a sensory relationship we don't have with our furniture of eating. Um, and I was interested in this. How could we also provoke the boundaries of the table? In French, there is a word plateau, which means tray, you know, often used in dining service, but plateau also means stage for performance, like in a theater. And so what if we were to disrupt that formally? What if we were to explore the boundaries of the table quite literally by creating more flexibility? And so these peaks and valleys allowed people to kind of play with the surface um, for it to almost become a choreographic medium as their bodies changed and shifted throughout this dinner in a way that, you know, maybe a dancer would, but provoked by the table. Uh, the, the valleys were actually, I'm gonna go back to the side, the peak that you see on this side, these are underneath the big secret, which I don't have a photo of, is that these are actually just mixing bowls. <laughs> so convex and concave stretched over. So the convex ones, you could stick glasses on like in the upper right-hand side and the concavities uh, we could put things into. And the interesting thing here is that this is a soup course. And so the soup was placed in front of people in this concavity and the result is that it bounced. So the food now performed for the diner. And that also was part kind of of the dialogue and the conceptual approach to this. Now, I think alongside it, another personal interest, and I think probably universal experience of food is that it also evokes emotion. So not only is it through, you know, touching or feeling or interacting with food, but also understanding how human emotion can be translated through this medium, food being our only multi-sensory material in the world. Because when we eat, we don't just taste, we see, we smell, we hear, we touch. Um, and at the time, I had been asked to open a bar and restaurant for the Museum of Sex in New York City. And I was researching aphrodisiacs, specifically uh, the history of them. And I found them to be pretty archaic. Like we were still using stories from like Casanova and Montezuma <laughs> in, you know, the early 2000s, which felt very old, not contemporary. So I wondered, you know, what would the contemporary narratives be today, specifically around this emotion of love, of desire? That is, I think, one of the most enigmatic emotions that we experience as humans because it has so many different meanings for so many different people. So I asked 15 different chefs and mixologists to um, create their definition of love through either food or drink, depending on their specialty. And the result of that was the love food book. And I put um, periods L-O-V-E to inspire the idea that it was a deconstructed approach to love because there are so many different definitions. Subtitle Libertinage Gourmand. If you speak French, you know that that's a salacious subtitle. <laughs> um, and so I went around uh, the world and photographed with these incredible chefs, got their stories, wrote, designed the book. And I'm gonna share a couple of my favorites with you. This first one being from Belgium, which at the time, a uh, wonderful chef, Kobe Deschamers, uh, had a restaurant called Indewolf. And I went to go meet Kobe and he, pulled out this, these two pigeons, and he put them on the table. And I said, oh, what, what is it? And he said, well, this is, this is going to be my dish about love. You know, <laughs> how we get from love to this image, I don't know. And then Kobe told me this story because his restaurant was actually in his childhood home. So Indo Wolf was a farm that his family owned when he was little. And he lived in it, he grew up in it, he tended the land. Um, he continued those practices at Indewolf by sourcing only truly local ingredients. And he said, you know, when I was little, I didn't have a lot of friends. It was just sort of me and the farm, except I had these two pigeons 
that were my friends and uh, they would come every day and I gave them names, you know, and I would sort of play with them. And one day my mother came to me and she said, Kobe, we have to kill the pigeons. And she said, why? And, and her response was, well, we have to eat. And so Kobe's first definition and let's say emotion around love for him was defined as sacrifice. And he created this dish to honor that feeling. And what he does is he stuffs the pigeons with hay and he lets them ferment for about two weeks. And in doing so, as you know, when a meat ferments, it, the, the tissue starts to, to deconstruct, becomes more tender. So pigeon, which is normally a very hard, tough meat, becomes quite soft. Then he takes the hay out of that and infuses it in a hay butter. And he cooks this pigeon meat in this infused hay butter. And the pigeon meat due to its fermentation also sort of has this funky, you know, like tinge to it, like a great wine or a great cheese will have. And you eat this dish and I can't tell you how incredible it is because you're tasting something that is so sweet, that is so tender, but at the same time, so bitter. And it is this feeling suddenly of being close to Kobe, to the feeling of sacrifice, to this kind of bittersweet experience of love that he must have felt as a child. On the other side of that was a wonderful trip to Chicago at the time with Omar Cantu, who is the chef and founder of Mochu Restaurant, one of the preeminent uh, molecular gastronomy restaurants um, of the time, pre-Alinea. And uh, I went and asked him and, and this dish was brought out, you know, what is love? And this is a little log, you know, it's about the size of my forearm. And what you see on here are like tiny, tiny scones, like mini little root vegetables, microgreens, dehydrated peas, uh, like a little bit of tapioca maltodextrin in there to do some fun things in your mouth, you know, and you get this dish and it's just full of wonder, like, what? And you lean into it and look into it. And he said, oh, yes, this for me is love. You have to look really close. Otherwise, you might miss it. <laughs> now, these two different spectrums and the book goes on. I invite you, if if you haven't gotten it to, to dig into it, it's really just a lovely lovely uh, point of entry into the human psyche and into all of the different variations of love and the emotions that can exist in the world. Uh, one of those that actually is less represented in the book um, is, is the emotion of risk. So I think also loving is also quite risky. And as I said at the time, I made this book while I was working with the Museum of Sex. And I actually also became their consulting creative director at the time. Um, and so I was opening uh, bars and restaurants for them. I did two in the in the space itself and also designed exhibitions and some rebranding and strategic partnership development for them. Um, but what came out of that, which is one of my favorite things, is this, is the, the final bar that we made, which is called Play, which was a bar and den that transformed, you know, from day into night, as you can see here, and lighting um, was built around this this bar from the 19th century that we brought in from England and was then flanked by stacks, kind of inspired by the stacks of a library where you store, um, where you store old, you know, archive books. And in the, in the US, there's always this mythology of like having sex in the stacks. So it was kind of this promiscu like implied promiscuity or implied secrecy within the space. Uh, Play was just a wonderful collaboration also with an interior architect called um, Resistance Design. One of the interesting things about it is that we try to design the environment, you know, to promote this kind of like playful riskiness. But the menu itself was also designed through the lens of mostly color and, and texture. So how could we start to add a little bit of like ooze and sizzle or crunch? Different textures in our mouth that would excite and stimulate our palate, as well as colors that would be rich and luscious. Um, you know, from like oozy little jellies to overflowing beers, um, crispy, actually this down at the bottom is like a crispy tofu skin, all these different flavors and textures that were somehow exotic and would also create a sound and a texture experience within our mouth that might reference the act of intimacy. Alongside of that, I designed um, an experimental cocktail menu. So I invited different artists to come and create cocktails with me that were based around um, gestures that we find in intimacy and in eating. So licking, sucking, biting, and sniffing. 
So pictured here is uh, a cocktail called Paradoilia, which is based around the gesture of licking. Paradoilia is the effect of like recognizing something in the clouds or hearing something in music being played backwards, you know, kind of finding implicit meaning or implied meaning. And this is designed in collaboration with um, the wonderful artist Bart Hess, who makes some, inc uh, Bart is such an, an incredible artist. And I think one of his most successful pieces is kind of the fabrics and the alien textures. He really addresses the human body um, at heart as a, as a material scientist too, I think. So I asked Bart to work on licking and went to his studio and started looking around and he had developed this sort of alien skin textile and we started to see it. And obviously you can look at it here. It just is, you know, implies a lot of things about the human body that maybe we want to acknowledge or not. And decided that we would make this into a black porcelain plate. And so this cocktail is served to you in a little vial and it is, uh, Nogori sake, so unfiltered sake, which has this really creamy, milky taste, slightly thickened with, um, with a guar gum and then a, a bit of yuzu popped into it. So it has this kind of milky, creamy, but also this sharpness and exoticism that yuzu fruit will bring to it. And it's poured on the plate as you're, ser you're served it. And so the only thing that you can do because the plate is so shallow, if you lift it up, it's going to spill any, everywhere. <laughs> the only thing you can do is, you know, what this person is doing is just lean over and lick it. And your, your tongue goes across the ripples, you know, of the, of the plate. You're starting to feel this kind of creamy exoticism. Without saying it, I think you all know what is implied here. The other part of this, which I think is the real beauty of this project, is that it also became a little piece of performance art. Because what it did is that when people would order this, you would look around the bar and you would see people kind of bobbing and weaving, like bending down to lick basically what looked like the table and coming up and everyone laughs, you know? And so it created <clears throat> this communal experience of play through performance through sensory experience, through the use of flavor that you can see, I think, builds on all of the prior projects that I have been interested in exploring in a really commercial setting. And so it was a way to disrupt a normal restaurant going experience, as well as disrupt and give permission to feel something that we might not give ourselves permission to feel in public space. Now, a big theme in my own work is the theme of play. Um, and I don't say play as like a, a funny, happy thing, right? I think play is a way of moving through life. So when we play with something, we are resilient, we respond, um, we invent, we create, we move with. Those are all definitions of play as well. So in parallel with this, I think I made, that was the not safe for work version. I was also really interested in this idea of licking. And so um, I was also doing a, a residency at the time with a great friend of mine, Carla Diana, who's a wonderful artist and technologist. And we decided to bring our two interests together, hers technology, mine food, uh, as well as our great desire to make a band. So this is <laughs> the mashup that um, they created what you see here, which is Lickestra, the world's first lickable ice cream orchestra. And so Lickestra is a series of rapid prototyped ice cream cones, inside of which is embedded a capacitive sensor. A capacitive sensor measures resistance, basically. We put a little cup of ice cream right in it. And then as people participate, they popped into these pedestals. We embedded the ice cream cones in these kind of classic gallery pedestals, white gallery pedestals to riff on this idea of gallery pedestal busts, kind of the classic form of, you know, sculptural representation in uh, the art of yesteryear. And so this was performed in a gallery setting, but it was a participatory experience. So people would pop inside of it. And then when they would lean over and lick, they would trigger a tone. So it sounds a little bit like this.
that video went on the internet and kind of broke the internet a little bit. Not a lot, but just a little bit. <laughs> Again, I, I went around, talked about this a lot. Um, and I think throughout it started to discover that technology, specifically new technology and its accessibility at that time could maybe be used also as an ingredient for food experience. That now we can have a sensory experience like sound that comes out of licking an ice cream cone that would allow us to play with our perception of what it means to eat and drink. Um, Lickestra is one of those projects that just keeps giving, you know, it can be played by children, by adults, and I think we all see different things in it, uh, which is something that I find to be interesting about work when you can address different layers. And within that is the idea of, of perception. So I think that within all of it, you know, our senses create our perception. They work together to make the meaning and the stories of our lives. Um, and one of my great interests is playing with that mostly just to create a mindset of possibility to foster a sense of possibility in myself and in the world, because I think we're most resilient when we have that outlook. So uh, a project that on the commercial side dealt with this is um, a recent project I did with the TED conference and Target, the large American retailer. So this every year, you know, the TED conference uh, gathers in Vancouver and every year Target does a, uh, a design dinner, which brings together the design community around a specific topic of interest. And so the topic for this, which was the last um, live TED conference that we were had, was perception. Uh, and so this uh, event was designed by David Stark Production, a really incredible designer and production agency, um, which was a circular table around which about, I think, 80 different members of the design community gathered around. And I designed the dinner for this through this lens of how could we play with perception. And so I used um, very simple ways to do that, like tropes, kind of a little bit of even cliches, I might say, do we eat our words? You know, and what might that be in food? So here you see a deconstructed gazpacho um, with tomato water. It served as kind of a salad with letters on top and everyone had a different letter. So it made a sentence around the table, you know, eat your joy was the sentence. And guests were given a little pitcher of tomato water, poured it in, and then it would kind of float like a child's alphabet soup would. So small moments of interaction here that really allowed people to, to play with an idea then of putting this in their mouth and having like a super duper beautiful tomato taste, even though it looks like they're eating water. Uh, the next course was served with a side of an asparagus paintbrush. I think this explains itself, um, along with kind of an abstract canvas. So the idea here was that food could become art, that there was art in our everyday, just depending on how you know we plated it or presented it. Uh, wrapped up with a very simple apple cake. And so we made these uh, really incredible, almost uh, lifelike apples that are white chocolate molds, you know, um, and then when you would break it open, you would see this beautiful chocolate or apple mousse that would come out of the center of it on top of a little bit of a graham cracker crumb. So simply, this is, I think, much more classic as a way of exploring, you know, how food design can be used to play with perception in fine dining scenarios. Within, I think, perception is the idea also that we're critiquing, we're asking ourselves to look beyond, you know, what we accept as an apple, what we accept as, um, you know, a way of eating, a way of being. And so on, uh, on that note, a few years ago, I was asked to participate in the um, International Documentary Film Festival Doc Lab section. That's a section of um, IDFA that explores new realities through new media. And so with a collaborator of mine, Klezine van de Zendeschlip, who's a Dutch Amsterdam based artist, we created this project called Eat Tech Kitchen, which is um, an interactive futurist kitchen in which we play the role of supporting hosts to uh, a bot. <laughs> who is kind of the host of the evening. So we used AI technology to code a very rudimentary chat bot um, called Bot a Chef from the Future. This was originally inspired by the Futurist Cookbook, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, I really invite all of you to read it. It's a seminal publication um, from about, I think, 1932 thereabouts, 
which takes uh, the futurist, the art movement of the time, that we're looking at um, the future specifically of Italian um, Italian society. And they used for one project, the cookbook, as a vehicle for provoking and pushing new behaviors, believing that people think, dream, and act according to what they eat and drink. Um, and so this idea, what came out of that was all of these speculative, totally absurd recipes that provoked people to act in radically different ways, eat in different ways. And so we were inspired by this and thought, well, how could we do that through a contemporary lens? And so we used a chat bot to engage with people, to have these private conversations that would kind of dialogue with them in funny ways, and then would spit out personalized recipes that asked them to use the ingredients of this installation some edible ingredients, some non-edible ingredients, and use the recipe as a script for performance. So asking people to plate their cell phones, um, to kind of imagine drinking batteries. It went on and on and on and on. <laughs> uh, some recipes were about defriending people on the internet. Some people were about unboxing Amazon. Uh, different ways to use the recipe as a critical medium to be able to play with um, the politics of the world around us. Now the last, I think I have a, just a few, two more projects um, within this, because I think you see this last one though, based I think on a modality of critique, is also was a performative project, not only for me, myself, I was acting in it, but it also asked the users, the audience, let's call them the guests, to be performers within that. And I think that you see throughout all of my work that that's a real interest of mine. Uh, my father was an actor when I was born. My brother is an actor today. I performed a lot. I think I'm still doing that even right now. Uh, performance and theater are really interesting ways throughout time that we have gathered as societies to understand ourselves um, and to reflect on ourselves. And so I wanted to address that more simply. So how could food be used as a medium for creating theater? And I got that opportunity in 2014 at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts, which is an arts residency outside of um, in Nebraska, in Omaha, in the United States. And I was asked to design their gala fundraising dinner. And so I designed this dinner that was a multi-course, multi-room dinner for about 250 patrons that traditionally would come to like, I'm sitting down to my chicken dinner and I'm going to auction, you know, I'm going to bid on art and that's how we fundraise. Here they were still bidding on art, but suddenly they were taken in the freight elevator down to the gallery floors and immersed in this um, kind of uh, neo food land that I invented called Circuit of the Senses in which they went through four different courses and four different rooms in nonlinear fashions, eating each dish, each like part of the four course menu in a room that heightened one sensory experience. And so, for example, this is the room that was inspired by the sense of sight. So guests sat down around these large format ice block tables and they were served, um, uh, they were served hot ramen on it. And the interesting thing that we discovered through exploring this is that anything hot that you put on an ice block, actually the temperature differential creates movement. So the food spun. And so the food would spin in front of you, which created this, you know, I will acknowledge very awkward way of eating, but also a totally different visual experience as slowly over the course of this dish, the lights faded, 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 faded to black. So your pupils are dilating, you're starting in a lit environment and you're ending in this totally dark environment while you're slurping and trying to catch, catch your food. The next um, course was all about the sense of smell. This was served on tables that I built that um, I would say that breathed. So the moment you put your elbows down, it was actually pegboard over dry ice and the vibrations therein would create these small puffs of vapor. And we had scented the dry ice with rosemary, essence of rosemary. So you had these rosemary clouds emerging from the table in front of you. While the room was totally pitch black, uh, waiters would walk around with flashlights illuminating different parts of it. So it really was this moment of discovery, of wonder, of total surprise as the table would kind of puff up um, you know, different olfactory clouds in front of you. And by removing the sense of sight, we also heighten the sense of smell. Alongside that was served um, a, 
a dish of chaomushi, so steamed Japanese egg custard that was infused with thyme and morels. So these really kind of rich uh, Mediterranean flavors that were that really brought out our sense of smell. Alongside that, this is a room that is inspired by the sense of sound. What you see here in front of you, I unfortunately don't have a video, but wanted to share it with you. These were grills. So this was based on like classic American traditions of outdoor grilling, but these are called Rubens tubes. So the line of flames that you see here um, has a speaker on one side of it. And as the speaker pumps different sound in, it, the sound wave is expressed in a fire wave. And guests were invited to go up and roast lemongrass marshmallows um, and put those on top of these incredible uh, kimchi dogs, <laughs> kimchi hot dogs. So creating this really exotic flavor um, an exotic experience of roasting marshmallows and eating hot dogs, which is a really classic kind of American picnic food. One of my favorite courses is this one. This is the sense of touch. Guests were invited into this long table, which seated about 30 people. And the moment they sat down, um, what happened is that a little hand came out of the slice of the table. Inside of the table were hidden 15 dancers. And the dancer's role was to serve dinner. And so the table fed you. And so it would come out, it would ask to shake hands, it would offer you drinks. Um, and then finally, what came out of it was the main course, which were uh, langoustine, which came out in little boxes wrapped in salt, salt baked langoustine. And so you would take this out and then open it up using your hands to kind of unpeel, eat this beautiful dish. Really everything implied in a sense of touch, but in a very playful and I think provocative way. So high level, I think I can maybe leave you with this is that food is so much more than just an ingredient. You know, it is play, it can be risk, it can be gesture, performance, culture, memory. And at heart too, I think it's a sensory interface. I'll leave you with um, these last two projects that show kind of the more contemporary ways I've been addressing that. That by playing with our senses, it becomes an interface for so many different industries, so many different practices, um, so much different value and so many different stories in the world. <laughs> I specifically add this just for comic relief because sometimes these presentations get long, but um, I was interested in uh, inventing the world's first sprayable cocktail booth as like an interface for play. Ready? So yep. this is a prototype. <laughs> You smell it all now. Oh, no, I'm busy. <laughs> Whoa! Wow! It's like two face! <laughs> <laughs> so fun! <laughs> so um, I'm adding that as a little bit of comic relief towards the end, but I also want to note this here that most of my practice is based on on this. The meaning that I make of it usually comes afterwards. The origin story is through play as for exploration. The sprayable cocktail booth never came to light, but it was a marvelous thing to prototype a bike pump hooked to a paint gun canister that was filled with <laughs> mint water, which is not the thing you ever want to spray in your face, by the way. <laughs> But it became this interface for delight, for refreshment in a wonderful way. Hopefully one day we'll find a way to use it. What it did inspire, though, is this idea of like being inspired by cocktails, by drinks. You know, how else could we experience this? One of the main elements in cocktails is ice. And so as you saw ice being um, something in my last projects that I use as tables, I thought, how could it become an interface? Say it! Say that! Say that! So these are singing oh, 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 oh. ice blocks. So that, I'm going to skip to it just to keep you us on time here. That was um, interactive ice block speakers. So when you touch the ice blocks, they also have capacitive sensors in them and they create sound. So you have a temperature, suddenly temperature, I think, really becomes the interface for that. Ice can become a vehicle for play.
And this idea, this a lot of this work here that you're seeing is more recent work as we evolve in culture, as technology becomes more accessible, as well as kind of the community that I um, am part of is really dis exploring and discovering how new media can be used as as a sensory via as a sensory interface. And this is um, another project that uses food as an interface for um, for immersive experience. This is a cotton candy theremin. It's a cotton candy machine around which there is an array of sensors that track your cotton candy spinning. And your cotton candy spinning becomes the controller for spinning a world of sugar particles and sound around you as you see moving here in the background. This was originally performed at the Panorama Music Festival in New York City on Randall's Island inside of a 71 foot immersive dome. Um, and so the cotton candy theremin was placed in the middle of it and people would come up in between kind of these immersive dome films. This was like the interstitial experience and they would spin cotton candy and in doing so they spun this sugar crystal universe. I mean think of how I started with this crappy little um, you know recording booth that I was trying to scrape and didn't get to it and uh, now where we've ended up which is spinning entire projected universes by making cotton candy. So I will leave you I think with this which is a a real belief that I have is that the hand is the instrument of the mind. My mother was a Montessori teacher. Um, this is directly quoted from Maria Montessori, the great, um, the great teacher who believed that embodied experience has a direct pathway to how we make meaning in our lives, to how we learn things and to how we experience the world around us. And I might evolve this today to also say that, you know, our mouth, our eyes, our ears, our nose, <laughs> let's say our body, is the orchestra of meaning. And in that lens, our senses really become a toolkit for meaning making. So how do you look beyond food? Uh, what does it mean in your life? What does it mean as, uh, as a medium in the world? And how can you tell a unique story that adds to our experience as humans here on earth? Thank you so much for having me. Um, and if you ever have any questions, this is my Instagram handle. I'm pretty active on it. You can always pop me a question or go to my website, which is my name. And my email is right there. Thanks so much. I hope I get to see you all in real life one day. Thank you, Emily. I hope so as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for a wonderful and kind of uh, teasing, you know. <laughs> uh, I think I'm not going to teach this afternoon because you already said so many things that if I was going to talk about it, that would be, uh, you know, over three hours. That's my, the time I have today. So, uh, but I don't have, I don't know if anyone has any questions, you want to share any thoughts? Um, are you curious about anything? I have like tons of questions, so I'm, I, I'm good. <laughs> but I don't know if someone wants to pay three people. Nope. Ice. Ice. Ice is wonderful. Actually, it's a wonderful thing. Okay, people, no questions, no comments. No. No. Okay, so I'll, I, actually, I, I could start just to break the ice, let's say. Uh, but uh, well, uh, ice is a wonderful thing because actually uh, um, um, it melts, but it melts the way you, 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 you can actually be in charge, right? It can give you power to uh, melt it in, in uh, faster, slower, in, on one side, not on the other one. You could create things out of ice. So ice was very inspiring. Thank you, Emily, for uh, giving us more of these ideas. But uh, one of the things that triggered my curiosity right from the beginning, and now you said something very interesting about telling your own story and telling one single story. And last week we were listening to um, this 2009 TED talk from, um, let's see if I can pronounce this well, uh, Shimamanda Ngozi. And she has this talk about um, the danger of a single story right and which is which is um it's it's amazing because um um she does talk about this perspective that is um imposed of you and what you told us about is like break the rules make the rules in the sense of break the concepts that you know were kind of imposed on you lick your food you know it's something uh, very interesting and you know i have children myself i say you know don't eat with your hands and then okay let's go to mcdonald's i mean 
you know, for, for, for this generation, it's okay. But um, for us in Portugal, um, um, my husband is Canadian and I think he has like this um, fast food thing. And, and when he arrived in Portugal, there was no McDonald's and he, 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 he really felt impressed. He said, how do you do it? <laughs> I said, well, I didn't know him by then, but he was really surprised. And the first McDonald's came along and everybody went to McDonald's because it was such an iconic thing and a cultural thing. And then he started to use his hands to eat and everybody looked at him like, you know, how oh, barbarian, what are you doing? That was his feeling, you know, at, at the time he thought like, how are you supposed to eat this? I mean, don't you know, you have to use your hands. So it's, it's we don't think of McDonald's like that anymore, I think, but, um, but it's very interesting how, when you bring an experience that we're, we're actually looking forward, but we're not so much into it, let's say when we're faced with it. So my question after all this comment is, how do people uh, react in this te terms of collaboration? Because I, I feel like this experience is as a, a, a um, collaboration experience. You create these moments, but also you don't know how people are going to react, do you? I mean, okay, I could invite my friends before just as, uh, you know, to test, uh, but, but does it, I'm not saying get ha out of control, uh, but like, but in the sense of how do people react? How do people react to hands coming uh, um, from under the table and feeding you? I was thinking about the, the beverage. I was like, how do they serve the beverage? You know, because it kind of tilts and then it spills over the person who is serving it because it's it's something that includes all the performers, right? The the people who create, the people who actually serve, the staff is very important. And so so I mean I've asked tons of questions, but but I, I don't know, Emily, does it make sense to you what I've what I've just uh, asked? Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot in there. I will reply first is that the touch table, the drinks were served in bags. So there was no oh, right. like seal bags. <laughs> you can <laughs> take that good... question out of your mind. <laughs> right. um, I think a big part of this is context. So I teach experience design at the School of Visual Arts in the master's uh, products of design program. And my studio specifically looks at the design of experience. And I think one of the main pieces of experience design, I boil it down into simple things like people, place, and props or products and place or context I think matters your example of Portuguese reactions to eating McDonald's french fries with your hands mm -hmm. um, for sure is cultural context I had the same experience going to France as a kid also you know being wowed that people were eating fries with a fork <laughs> <laughs> um, right. so I think that there is a decent amount when we do this kind of work that isn't shown and illustrated that could be another whole hour presentation is just deconstructing the experience design around these so a big part of my work as a designer and as an artist is to design the moment that someone walks not just through the door but even before then how they're receiving information about coming, what kind of language is used. So a lot of this work comes along with words like experimental, uh, performance, art, things that aren't associated naturally to food, which puts people in a different mindset. Because the, the worst thing that you can do is not prepare someone, not set up their expectations for the general idea of what they're getting into really disrupting someone to the point of them being afraid or feeling too challenged creates a negative experience. So in experience design, I think we, we start, you know, the moment that someone interacts with the idea, how is that designed? How are we using language and color, um, photography, sound, like all of that has to be consistent across the board for the experience to continuously set someone up for success. Um, as well as create the conditions for them to pleasurably be provoked. So I think that's that's the goal with all of these is that they're asking us, my interest is to ask us to provoke ourselves, not as sort of like a, uh, you know, like that's cool, we don't have to do it this way, but instead as an invitation into possibility um, to create a mindset and a way of being curious filled with wonder, more open to the world. And so just as like you would introduce, I think, a little kid to a new activity, you wouldn't just drop them in the thing. They're going to get frustrated and angry and throw stuff, you know. 
But if you show them how to do something, or if you say, you know, we're going to a new park today, or we're going to so and so, you explain what's going to happen. All of those things then allow us to relax because we know what our conditions are and we know what might be asked of us. So all of this work comes with a decent amount of, of experience design around it that does a little bit of storytelling up front or throughout that helps people along their way. Yeah, well, today we're going to talk about narratives, so it fits our Yeah, our yeah, yeah, that's a better way to say it, yeah. <laughs> Because of all the storytelling, but you don't really have to, and, and I'm so glad you didn't follow um, kind of a timeline, right? You followed this uh, ideas and this, um, so I think that's very important in terms of, of a narrative and the idea of playfulness and provo being provocative. It's something that um, brought, shed some light. Could I ask you another question or as anyone else has another question? No? Well, from, yeah, thank what, you, <laughs> from what you just said, when you think about all the experience from before the experience begins. So in a way, do you, you guide the, the, the diner or the people or it's, uh, do you think about everything that you want to happen and everything that shouldn't be happening or you just think, I don't know, or, or you leave something to people's reaction because everyone has a different uh, view and a different, and I would think a different reaction. How do you see your, I don't know if I made myself clear, but how you, you see your role as the experience maker, if you want yeah. to guide the, pe the per person all the way through or just leave some to chance or, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, maybe it can go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think of myself maybe most clearly as a shepherd, like that, you know, when you're shepherd, like shepherding a lot of sheep, you're basically creating conditions for going, you know, over here or over there. Now, what happens between the sheep is up to them, right? In general, there is a herd mentality. So if all the sheep are going in this way and they're all walking in front of each, like one foot in front, all the sheep are gonna go that way. Every now and then there's one sheep that's like, I'm gonna turn in circles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you're like, ah, we're not going that way. What am I going to do with that sheep? Like, come on, you know, and I'm not using this example or metaphor to say that people are sheep, but I think that that the we create the conditions. What I do do is when I am, I have a phase in my creative process where I become the most anxious person ever. I imagine everything that could go wrong like everything, worst case scenarios, more, you know, uh, classically one might call them edge cases. Like what are all the random things that could happen? Like that, no, that would never happen. No one's gonna take the plate and like smash it over their head. Well, someone <laughs> might, right? <laughs> and what that does is it creates, uh, usually it expands the conditions and then you start to realize like, so if, if this might happen and this might happen and this might happen, what do I need to do then, you know, in my shepherding or in the design of my conditions to account for that? You know, and some of those are, are ridiculous. Like if someone is taking a plate and smashing it over their head, the security guard will come and escort them out. Like that's how we solve for that. Mm -hmm. But how do you start to, you know, create the problems that might happen and see if it is the consequence of your design strategy or if it's something, you know, that is so wild that, you know, it's, it's about removing that person or, you know, finding something else for them to do. So I think that's, that's usually my strategy because there isn't the, I'll give you one other strategy that I think is always good to use too. A friend of mine, Melissa Abe, who's a really wonderful creative director and producer told me once, she said, I always design for the shyest person in the room. So I think that's also a very generous way to think about our work is that when we want to do these things that are pushing people beyond their boundaries, what does the shyest person in the room, what are they able to do? And how do we start from there? 
right? So the shyest person in the room might not want to go up and lick the ice cream, but maybe they want to like film the people doing it. What are the other elements that we can give them that allow them still to participate? Or maybe they want to be the scooper, you know, they're like, I'm just going to let you go do that. You go do that, right? But they facilitate the experience. There's always a role for different kind of archetypes of people. And so if you also think through not only what are the worst case scenarios, but what are all the different kinds of people that exist in the world? And we all do generally fall into some kind of archetype. And how will this experience be for them? And what can I do to involve them? And, and that's at different scales and at different levels. So it's a participatory approach. And I think it's an empathetic approach um, as well as maybe like a, you know, a, a, a risk awareness approach that allows you to then design for all the different conditions and create success. Because success sometimes is not about everybody doing the thing that you think that they're going to do, but success can be about everyone finding their place within the experience. Um, and then the other kind of formula that I would also use is like the metaphor of a menu, you know, like that's hospitality design, like the design of a meal, I think is just one of the most rich experience typologies to study because there's so many ways that restaurateurs have designed to engage people to let them know where they are in the experience and a menu is a great example of that you know and you can have a menu in any part of life you know a doctor's appointment if I had a menu I would feel better right yeah. like this is going to happen first and then this is going to happen and then you could go to the bathroom here and then, you know <laughs> so the higher risk something is um I think often you want to give more awareness of what is going to happen and then leave room for people to explore within it because I think the worst kind of experience design is when people feel controlled so there always has to be room for experimentation for discovery you know you make kind of the conditions you point them in the direction so they think they know what they're doing and then you allow for a lot of surprises therein you know, just like dessert is like apple tart and then the little apple shows up that does not look like a tart that looks like a real apple and you crack it open and, you know, it's mousse. That's a very simple literal example, but I think you can extrapolate from there and apply it to different kinds of experiences, specifically food experiences. Does that answer yes, a little course. bit more? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm not sure. I think I think Ricardo would be the person, as Emily, that would think about in our experiences what could go wrong, and I would be the person telling him, "That's not going to happen. <laughs> Don't even go that way." Uh, and and then none of us is right actually because it's kind of a balance. The balance you said at the beginning, right? The equilibrium uh, will will eventually happen. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question. Yes, but, it no. Yeah, I'm afraid because I'm having some buildings here in my house outside. So sometimes they do a lot of noise. So, that's right. Right. so if, oh, if they make a lot of noise, you won't listen to me. But I wanted to ask, uh, uh, Emily was saying that um, you should, uh, in a way, prepare the people for the things that are going to happen. So you don't have uh, big surprises. But don't you think that if um, if you tell them exactly what is going to happen or what they are going to find, um, can't he break a little bit the the suspense or the unexpected? Like um, sometimes people die, they go to an event thinking that okay we are going we are going to a dinner you know they are expecting a dinner and suddenly uh, the dinner is something that is not exactly a dinner so they become surprised and that surprise in a way is something positive because they were they were uh, surprised they were not expecting that and they were completely um surprised i don't know what to say in english so don't you think yeah. that if you tell them exactly what is going to happen you can break a little bit the 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 surprise? I think there is, that is up to you to decide what emotional experience you want to offer. So 
telling people what is going to happen can be as much or as little as you want. Of course, you would send an invitation like come to dinner and it turns into like a butchery session is a is a different right that's a totally different spectrum. Um, that really is, I think, up to the designer, just like, um, you know, a dial where you will turn it up or down the amount that you reveal. Will create more of a sense of safety and security. Uh, and then the surprises, obviously, the less that you reveal will create more surprise. The question I think always around surprise is, when does surprise become scary and when is it delightful? And that's the question that you have to choose when you design the context, your menu, let's say, right? I think it's wonderful in like, for example, in fine dining, when you get something that, you know, says it's like, you know, the chicken course and it shows up in like a deconstructed way. Oh, like I know what chicken is, but I've never experienced it in this way. So we have a little bit of familiarity that we can go on, right, to, to allow us to enjoy something with pleasure. I'll use one example that I have often referred to is Alinea, so Grant Akats in Chicago has this wonderful restaurant, Alinea. And early on when he started, they had this dish that was uh, served like on this weird skewer thing. It was like this kind of aggressive, like <laughs> lots of wires. And then at the top of it was this little fried thing that looked hairy. Like the whole thing was very aggressive in form and in design, right? And it was brought into in front of diners placed in front of them. Now, when we also talk about cultural context, this is in Chicago. Most of these people are in the Midwest of Chicago. The middle of America at that time when Alinea opened had not encountered molecular gastronomy. Fine dining was still like steak and double baked potatoes, right? Like a very traditional American palate. And so Grant is really just like throwing provocations at people like, try this, try this, try this, you know? And here's this thing that shows up like it's gonna eat you. It's like scary looking. And the waiter tells you, you have to, you can't use your hands. So you're like, ah, like, whoa. The beauty of that dish is in its flavor because you put it in, in your mouth and what it is, is it's a fried peanut butter and jelly, which is a very classic American flavor. Like kids put that in their lunch, you know, it's peanut butter with jelly in a sandwich. And it's instantly familiar to the palate. And so I think that is part of this idea of designing equilibrium or deciding, you know, he decided to put that familiarity in the flavor. He didn't put it in the form or in the service, but he gave people something to hold on to, something that was familiar. And that is a principle of experience design. And when we think about it with food, we can use flavor to do that as well, is something that if you're going to surprise people, if you're going to push them beyond their limits, you have to find something that they can hold on to. Um, or you have to frame it as like extreme sports or like, you know, like something totally wild. You know, you can also do that if nothing is familiar. But if you want to do it for kind of a general audience, that's where you have to always consider who are you designing for? Uh, what, is their, what is their appetite quite literally for risk, you know? And so where do I put in little, you know, little bits of familiarity that keep them like sort of safe along the way. That's how I think about it, that allow them to feel comfortable and they can see themselves and reference their lives. And the last little piece here that I'll put is that delight is often experienced as something that you know remade in a new way. So something that is delightful is not totally new is not totally surprising is not like oh my god that's an alien wow that's not delightful what is delightful is being like oh i i always thought carrots were like this but they can also be like this right so delight has a reframing component to it and i think that's where it kind of fits into this idea also of that dish that i explained at alinea is that you can experience something you know in a new way. And what that does psychologically is it allows us to be in a place of possibility because possibility is contextual, right? It has to have a known that then has a variable next to it.
And that puts people in a mindset of curiosity and openness and pleasure because they're comf they're also comfortable in it, you know, constantly pushing and provoking people all the time is like, you know, it gets hard. <laughs> yeah, it's tiring. Yeah. Also. yeah, it's tiring. It's tiring. Yeah. It's like creating all those climax. You have to have one climax because if you keep them yeah. all up there, they're they're going to fade in the end. They're going to be exhausted. And you yeah, don't yeah. <laughs> well, it makes adrenaline in our bodies, you know. Yeah. And like when you hit adrenaline all the time, you do get really tired. And every good film, like I think studying film for me was really so important because you start to study how stories are built, story arcs, you know, and there's always a dramatic climax somewhere. And as people, we look for that, you know, even if we're not in a linear fashion, we're still looking for the one big thing, you know, and then we're, we're used to having dialogue and different scenes supporting that buildup. So I think you can deconstruct experience design and you can deconstruct food experience design and menu design, even I think in that way as a narrative experience. I, I think we can see how all the areas that you have been working on come together. And like you were talking and I was thinking, yeah, classic tragedy, of course. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. You have all the moments and then, well, yeah, if he dies, it's a tragedy. If he lives, it's a comedy, who knows? So it's maybe it's tragic yeah. comedy. <laughs> maybe he lives, but in a bad shape. So I mean, so, so it's very, very interesting how all these areas come together and help you to build uh, an, an experience. Well, I have no further questions. Uh, anyone else? Or we can, we can as, oh, sorry, Andrea. I, sorry, Andrea. I remembered one, because when you were talking about your, uh, your food as memory archive, yeah. did you use that archive to do some kind of uh, immersive experience, dinner, something? Or how? I, yeah, how you... I have in the, I should use it more. It still exists in like a web, you know, site from 1942, it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I, you know what, I evolved that project and I did like a data driven, tried to make like a personalized meal that would allow you to eat your own memories. I thought that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I did something that was inspired by that, but I've never okay. used that. And it's a wonderful reminder that it would be a really good thing to go back to. <laughs> if you want to use it, I'll yes. give it to you too. <laughs> no, but I, I, don't, I, I like the memory part of food. So yeah. uh, to think what we can do with that, because it's so different from for everyone. So yeah. it's very hard. I think to to take it and use it in a way that's really meaningful again, not just from when the memory happened or maybe creating new memories. So I like that play. So I was wondering how you could use that, how you could uh, also play with it. Yeah. You know, I think there's such, there's real practical value in elderly care there also, you know, to use the memory, mm -hmm. like food memories to also create brain health, but also a sense of comfort at the end of life. Those I think are very practical, that, that's a, a practical thing that comes to mind, you know, and also somewhat poetic, but those are very meaningful ways to be able to use memory in someone's life. Um, and I think that for a lot of it, the questions I would all, I asked myself listening to those archives too, is like mostly the big, for me, the experience was, is that I felt more intimately connected to another person when I hear about their memories. Yeah. And then what happens when I taste it, same thing with the love food book was just, you know, the human experience on the making side of that was wonderful. You just felt so close to the people. And I think we all look for that in one form or another, you know, we want to belong, we want to relate. And food is a really wonderful material for doing that and medium for doing mm -hmm. that. So I think your, your instinct feels really right. Yeah. yeah. You should check where those people are and if they have new memories. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of big brother. It's going to yeah. be in trying to find out who are those people and what are their memories. 
you know, so it's, it's a very interesting. Well, it was amazing. I mean, we've been here for one hour and a half and it sounded like just half an hour actually. So thank you so much, Emily, for uh, oh, being thank here you. with us. And um, well, I, I'm, I'm sure if they have any question, they can still send it to you or post it or yeah. you know, visit your Instagram and all right. Yes. Yeah. Thank okay. you all so much. Thank have you so a wonderful much. rest of the year. Thank you. I hope I get to see what you end up with. I'd love to oh, see it. Oh, all right. All right. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, people. Be brave. <laughs> all right. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm.